Salutations and welcome, my sweet friends. It is I, Dave Makes Noises. Welcome to Mr. Ripper. Today, we're asking the community, what is your funniest DungeonMaster.exe has crashed moment? Part three. How I, a newbie player, broke a veteran DM. I started playing D&D 5th edition back in August 2019 after the owner of the local comic shop told me about the group. The DM is a veteran, both because of having played D&D and other related games for nearly 20 years, and also for having served in the Marines, wherein he was wounded in action and had to deal with the effects of those injuries, both physical and mental. Now, one thing to note about the group is that virtually every player had some sort of disability. One dude was legally blind, well, he needed a really bright light to see, and another dude was born with just one arm. I myself have autism. As for the size of the group, at our greatest, there was a dozen players. We actually had to use two long tables. Ah, the joys of pre-March 2020. Anyways, I'm the sort of person who likes researching every aspect about a topic, and soon I realized that the DM only had the core rule books: Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, and Dungeon Master's Guide. Especially after I started talking about races and the like not in the Player's Handbook. Whenever I'd talk about such things, he'd go, Show me official proof and I'll allow it. Problem is, I didn't have proof, either in a PDF or a book. Now, one thing you might want to know is that I like going to the library, and the librarian and I are on good terms. I asked her to look for some D&D books for me. One day, about two months in, I had watched EXP to level 3, and thus had heard about the Celestial Warlock. So I chat with my DM. Could a holy priest be a warlock? He was of the opinion that it would be like a real-life priest serving both Mammon and God due to the patron option in the handbook. Fiend, Fae, Great Old One. I was like, what if a Celestial was a patron? He was like, sounds homebrewed slash third party. He didn't allow homebrew or third party material for race or class. I'm like, I'm sure it's official. He looks at me and says, prove it and I'll allow it. Well, turns out that I'd picked up Xanathar's Guide to Everything and on page 54 is the Celestial Warlock. Next session, I brought the book in, placed it next to him and told him to look at page 54. DM's a good sport at any rate, so he took a look. As he read it, we initially laughed at the idea of unicorn knights, but then he read the powers. And this dude, I swear upon my dice, failed both a wisdom save and an intelligence save. As the dude sat back and did the thousand yard stare you see in war movies, I don't know what all he saw in that moment, but if Tiamat had popped in and asked for tea, none of us would have been more surprised. Another player, one arm actually, looked at me and said, I, I think you broke him. When the DM finally made his saves, he looked at me in shock, awe, and respect. He got his own copy soon after. Later on, got my mother interested in playing, and while figuring out what to have her play as, we'd gotten to Monk when some other player yelled out, Tabaxi Monk. DM's like, Tabaxi? I'm like, Volos. And I showed him the book. He held up better that time. Annoyingly, things being the way they are, and with him having moved away, I haven't played with that DM since just before March 2020. Hopefully a D20 with roll in our favor, and we'll meet again. We still text every now and then, though. Been telling him about some of the other books. Hopefully he's expanded his collection. I was playing a 20th level Jedi Guardian in Star Wars D20, and we had just finished a support mission for the Republic on the surface of a planet before returning to our mothership. Just as the party reaches the command bridge to meet our commander, a superstar destroyer jumps into the system and threatens to undo all the hard-fought work we just did. I did some number crunching and found that if myself and my Padawan, another player, burned every force point we had and rolled very high, we could use the move object skill to save the day. We each begin meditating for a few moments while our soldier flew us close enough to lower the DC enough to not kill us, and when we finally got within range, double nat 20s. We had just ripped the ship designed to dominate and control entire solar systems in half, right down the middle. Our GM went glassy-eyed before his brow furrowed and went shaking skyward all while he was cursing and laughing maniacally. The ship was meant to be a whole adventure just to deal with, but by burning all our space magic and nearly dying of a turbo aneurysm, we curved it so hard we broke our friends. It was during a 3.5 edition Living Greyhawk campaign a battle interactive involving multiple judges and members of the triad. The high-level tables had to kill a dragon. The low-level tables had to retake a castle that overlooked a fishing village. I was supposed to be at the high-level table, 
12th level rogue, level one cleric, but was delayed due to traffic. When I arrived, the eight low-level tables had not begun to retake the castle. Somehow, due to being the highest-ranking member in the military, a sergeant and a cook in support services, I ended up in charge. I led a group that took the toughest part of the castle and helped the other tables catch up. Once we had retaken the castle, I organized repair efforts for castle defenses and healing the wounded. This is when we received word of a huge orc army coming to take the castle. The orcs approached, saw lots of people manning the walls, and proceeded to dismantle the fishing village to make siege engines. Judge announced that we had hours to prepare. The problem with the living Greyhawk system was the spending cap. You could only purchase items based on your level, not on what you could afford. My rogue spent money like a drunken sailor, and my favorite words were spoken. Hours to prepare. I called over two judges and the triad members and revealed my plan. I had multiple scrolls of spike stones. I had multiple wands of fireball, some at level 3, some at level 5. I had multiple wands of true strike. I had a liar of building. My plan was simple. Range out every landmark on the battlefield. Make sure the orcs charged through spike stones. Mages would use the true strike wands on the siege engines and wands of fireball on enemy formations and enemy siege engines as they got into range. A bard would use the lyre of building to keep the gates from being bashed in. Everything worked beautifully. The other six judges were not expecting the orc army to be bested so easily. They were stymied. Not one single orc survived. My character received medals and commendations, but alas, no promotion. Oh, I got a good one for you. It's a bit long, so buckle your seatbelts. D&D 5th Edition, three players plus the DM. Our Goliath, a known tavern keeper, found a pin that if you hold it and say, I need respite, would transport you to a dimension between realms, a tavern that was in between the planes of existence. The Goliath went there, and since the rest of our party couldn't come with and was sleeping, we decided to have a fun filler session. The other player and I improved some new NPCs we'd play. The DM even invited another friend to help play the bartender. In that little filler episode, the DM decided to bring out the deck of many things, just to play around with it. But it would likely have no real consequences in the normal game setting. Our party had come across the deck of many things before. The Goliath had drawn a few cards, losing all his earthly possessions, been there, then gaining a cool magic shield, and then getting a castle. Also been there, never finished the story to get my castle, but he gave the castle away when bargaining with a bad guy earlier in the game. So we all draw cards, having a fun, consequenceless time when our Goliath drew his first card. He had an exchange with the barkeep that the rest of our regular party would also get magic pins if he drew two cards. He hesitantly drew a card and looked at it. He got the castle again. He got the same card. Again. The DM laughed and let him keep the castle in the normal game just, just because of the funny coincidence. Then the Goliath drew again. Us, as the players, didn't know what the card meant, but the face on our DM was priceless. We weren't sure if it was bad or not. We were scared the Goliath would be killed or something. The DM was so shocked. He got on the ground, in the fetal position, face down. He sat there for a few minutes before he said that the Goliath got three wishes. Because of how lucky he got, the DM let him keep the wishes too. And since he followed through with the deal, the Goliath received two more magical pins. TLDR, Goliath goes to different dimensions, screws with the deck of many things, and walks away with three wishes, another castle, and three total magical pins. DM lies on the floor in shock. My boyfriend has been trying his hand out at being a DM for our Ruby D&D, this being my first D&D game as well. Well, unbeknownst to my boyfriend, a major rule of Ruby would be broken in one session. For some context, Grim, the main enemies of the campaign, don't feel any emotions. They are never supposed to become friendly. But that's exactly what happened. One of the PCs convinced a grim spider into attacking its brethren. PC critically succeeded, boyfriend critically failed. His name is Peter, the Stockholm Spider. <sighs> My boyfriend crashed for a good five minutes before continuing the session. My DM does a lot of voices, and he was trying to remember the voice for one of our PC's adopted mom. She has a southern accent, but our DM could only seem to do Australian. Try as he may, any time he tried to do a southern accent, it only came out Australian till he proclaimed, I can't control it anymore, and left the Discord voice chat for like five minutes to try and purge Oceania from his system. Scorps note. Scorps. I've been there. In one game I was DMing, I was trying to voice an Irish shopkeeper. My son's character was a spy, so he kept changing his look and speech patterns. He 
he decided that his character was going to start talking in a thick Southern accent. My Irish quickly became Texan, and I could not get it back. I finally just made the shopkeeper Southern and called it a day. Thanks, Scorps. Scorps. Get over here. We were raiding a floating inverted mountain, and that happened to be a fortress of the last remaining storm giants on the entire plane in order to prevent them from calling more of their illithid allies to the plane, which was also being attacked by the God of Nightmares. We end up in the main room, and our eldritch knight, played by my roommate, sees, as we all do, two important-looking magical items floating on a pedestal. She's 60 feet away, and ended up going first in the initiative. Her. I move 30 feet toward the pedestal. DM. Okay, you still have an attack or spell you can do. They're a new player, and forget things a lot. Her. I cast Misty Step to the top of the pedestal. DM. It's just in range. Her. I grab the artifacts. Our DM makes them roll a strength check. They succeed. There's a massive magical explosion sending her flying against the far wall of the room, and it turns out that those two items were the only things keeping the magical floating mountain in the sky. He just stares at my roomie blankly for a few minutes. DM, the mountain begins to fall. You're all pinned to the ceiling. After a lot of spell shenanigans and using gaseous form, we managed to escape, but the mountain fell and crushed the only remaining dwarven civilization on the plane, so accidental genocide. He needed a few minutes to process that. My usual group had a level 21 shot where I played a lizard folk battlemaster fighter named Tort. He also happens to be a hermit who is seeking enlightenment. The thing is, I forgot to mention to the DM that Tork thought enlightenment was a person. So when Tork asked a cult leader dragon if they knew someone named Enlightenment, both the dragon and the DM paused for half a minute. That is still one of my proudest D&D moments. I was playing Melantha, a human battle sorcerer, unearthed arcana sorcerer variant class in D&D 3.5. I don't remember the details as to how, but at some point we ended up in the 1960s version of the world we were playing in and my character decides she wants to buy some new clothes to avoid unwanted attention. I just realized something, I said, turning to the DM. My character is from an era before panties were invented, and she's wearing a skirt. The long, awkward silence that followed was nothing short of glorious. Hey there, hi, hello, and thank you for attuning the dendrites of your infinite cosmic consciousness to this undulating fleshy teat of sweet tabletop gaming ambrosia. If your dungeonmaster.exe has crashed, we'd like to see your crash report right here in the comments. If you've got another story you'd like to share with the community, please do so in our official subreddit, r slash Mr. Ripper, so it can be tagged and tracked for future videos just like this one. If you're a DM or a player looking for a group, you may want to check out Mr. Ripper's Group Finder, a Discord server we put together to help you. You guessed it, find a group, hence the name. This week, I hope you maintain homeostasis to the utmost of your ability. If you want to see me around, you can find me on TikTok and Instagram at Dave Makes Noises. You have been wonderful. I have been Dave. This has been Mr. Ripper. Please sub for Nat 20s. Ding that dong if you're a timely Tim. No tardy Marty's permitted. Thanks again for watching till the end, you absolute sweetie pie, and we will see you next time.